Hello, you thousands of beautiful incarnations of me, and welcome to season two, episode 10 of Dual Unity. I'm playing the part of Andrew today. And I was thinking about abandoning the part of Ray and just going throughout the episode as this dude, but I thought that might get a little confusing for anybody who's new to the podcast. So I'm just going to stick with Ray this time, but for future reference, it might end up being the Dualistic Unity podcast with Andrew and this dude. Or, or maybe I could be this guy and you're this with this guy and this dude. <laughs> You'd be like, fuck, which one, are, which one is it that I'm supposed to be? Which one's guy? It's like, yeah, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Yeah, not really. Just the same thing, making sounds. Exactly. That's perfect. Um, I just wanted to start off today's episode with a few announcements. We usually end up leaving these towards the end of the episode because we get so involved with the conversation that we were having leading up to the intro that we just forget to tell you all these exciting things. But um, the first and, and the first and biggest announcement is that Andrew and I will be meeting in person for the first time in the very near future. Arrangements have been made. Um, the bad news is that I'm not gonna tell you when it's happening here on the podcast. I will be making that announcement this Wednesday in our live group chat on Patreon. So Patreon supporters will get all of the, the details and uh, you know the tidbits of information as we gear up for this trip. They'll be told when the trip is happening. We'll do some live streams while we're together. So they'll have access to that as well. And of course, there will be a bunch of extra behind the scene footage that's gonna happen that will be available on Patreon exclusively. But we're also going to film uh, an episode of the podcast while we're together. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and that's coming up again in the very near future. So if you want to know more about that, definitely join us on Patreon. Yeah, absolutely. Super pumped for that. I think we'll probably do some Patreon exclusive live streams also. Just get those in there while we're together. Probably toss in you know, all sorts of, all sorts of different stuff. But yeah, super, super excited for that. Uh, yeah, very pumped to, to finally, finally, after what's it been six months and like 24 episodes, it'll, it'll have been, well, I mean, by the time we meet, it'll be way more than that, but yeah, very, very exciting. Uh, it's going to be epic. It's going to be just fantastic. Andrew's going to be coming out to my neck of the woods here on Vancouver Island. So I'm very excited to be showing him around. Um, we've got a place that backs on to a small private-ish forest, which is going to be great. So we're going to take some walks, talk about that. He's going to go down to the ocean front with me. And I, he's just going to find out what I'm like when I'm not on Zoom or, or coming across over camera. So I'm much weirder in person. Um, this is going to be an epic journey. So definitely, if you can keep in touch with us during the, the uh, lead up to that journey, then you should do that on Patreon. If you don't know, we already uh, talked about this on Discord a little bit. So join us on Discord as well, because we'll give you some updates here and there as well. Um, but we will try to refrain from talking about it too much on the podcast outside of announcements here and there. Yeah, absolutely. Going to be a great time. Um, did, you have, did you have any other updates that we wanted to get to beforehand? Um, otherwise, we can... I do, actually. Just a few more things. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly that we do have a Q&A episode coming up for this season in the next few episodes. We're not exactly sure when. We do have some guests lined up. Um, there's a guest coming up in the next episode. We have roundtable number four coming up in April. So we're not sure when the Q&A episode is going to be coming up. But if you have questions and you would like us to discuss it, definitely submit those questions on Patreon or in Discord or contact us directly via social media. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. The last Q&A episode it ended up being about three hours by the time we got done. We're willing to take the challenge. You just submit as many as you can and we'll do our best to burn through them. Yeah, love love the Q&A episode. Those might be one of my favorite types of just content, especially when it's long form. The more questions you give us, the more answers, not even answers, just discussions we'll have about the topic that is brought up on the question is a better way to put it, I think, because again, we are not, not teachers, we're not gurus. You'd stop listening to us right now and you'd be perfectly fit to accomplish and, and do anything and everything you've ever wanted to in your life. It's all within you. So anyway, that being said, we do enjoy getting questions though. So if you got them, let us know. Especially if you are busy on Wednesdays and you haven't been able to attend any of the live groups where you can ask these questions to us in person, this is definitely your chance to have us address that question on a podcast. And, and if you can make it to a Wednesday live group, definitely do, because we do answer these questions on the fly and, and do our best to just kind of go through them with you. As Andrew said, we're not answering any questions. So this is about as close as we can get to a chat 
with our followers, with our audience, um, until we can get to the point where we're having live events where we can actually meet with you in person and then just chat in person in this way, in the same way, exactly like this, where it's just you, me, reality here and now, and the experience of that. And that's all this conversation's ever meant to be. It's definitely never meant to be um, instruction. It's funny, I made a video recently about why I left for 10 years uh, and, and stopped participating on social media, stopped making content for, for the public as a whole, despite life coaching and all of that. And it was just interesting because it made me remember, right. It's because it didn't, it didn't feel like it was, it was legitimate. Like it still felt like it was cerebral. It still felt like it was rote. It still felt like, although I was seeing it for myself, it was still being translated through the filter of all the concepts that I had learned about it. And so that, that 10 years of walking away, of taking those concepts and making it applicable, of actually seeing how it applied to my life in my day-to-day -day job, how it applied to my life as a new parent, how it, apply, how it applied to my life as a husband or, and so on, that's really where, where it came into play. Because if the philosophy itself isn't something that you can immediately reach to, to cut out the distortion that you're experiencing to cut out that lack of empathy that's clouding the conversation between you and someone else well then what good is it right and that's that's where philosophy falls short right philosophy is always just clever it's always a clever conversation but it's in changing our priority it's in changing who we are that what we do changes and, and so i just wanted to mention that very quickly um, in terms of this episode especially because in this episode we've been asked to cover a particular topic and I wanted to, to say early on that in covering this topic, we are doing so from what we experience in our reality as who we are as the present. So there's no other way for us to have this conversation outside of from the foundation of what is. We're not coming at this from a dualistic belief or a dualistic conceptual idea of the topic. And, and just to let everybody know and make that clear, we're talking about death today. Specifically, the question is, how do you two deal with death? Because even if we believe in dualistic unity, and that brings us peace about death, there has to be some fear of losing our individual consciousness. And that's a fair point, because to say we're all one, to say there is no death, is one thing. To recognize what that means is something else. And I'll refer to the Gospel of Thomas specifically here um, in the first couple of lines where Jesus or Yeshua says, he who understands this or those who understand this will not taste death. And there's a very real reason that he said that, and it's very true. And so we're going to get into that on this episode. We're going to deviate and go around, and I'm sure we'll, we'll cover a, a bunch of other side quests on our path, but uh, this is the general concept for this episode. And uh, I'm really curious to see what Andrew has to say about it, because I know he's been thinking about this for at least six months. Yeah, absolutely. Um... It's something that, like, I'm not going to come on here. And I've been asked before my thoughts on death and if I'm afraid of death. And, and you know, when I'm not caught up in my mind and thinking about everything that's happening, there's nothing that I fear. There's no fear when there isn't, you know, at least that mental sort of anxious fear when there isn't so much there, you're not so caught up in thought and, and in identification. So I think when it comes to death, so like right now, I'm not thinking about death specifically or, or Andrew dying. So no, I'm not afraid of Andrew dying. But if I start thinking about it and then sometimes it comes up because as much as I know that Andrew is a character and an identity and, and that I am everything and, and there is no me that isn't an illusion i'm i'm not going to say that i'm i'm completely you know not afraid of it at all but what i will say is that there's a lot less and sometimes none all the time because i think it's like when you think about you dying it's it's you thinking that you are that which dies so the illusion you know it's not that death is an illusion the illusion is that you are something that can die and that you are something that ends with the death of this idea with this character so the more time you spend questioning this identification the less closely tied you are to this idea or this character the less fear 
there is of anything, including death. So anytime that someone, you know, comes at or, or bashes your identity or your character, it feels like a little death because they're, they're like chipping away at that identity. So if you are tied to that identity, you think that identity is you, then of course you're going to feel hurt. And of course, when you think about death, you're going to, you're going to be afraid of it, but the less you identify as this fictitious idea, which is typically rooted in past, everything leading up to right now, the more afraid you're going to be of, of anything happening, the more you're afraid you're going to be of putting yourself out there, the more afraid you're going to be in social situations. If you tend to get anxious in those situations, the more afraid you're going to be of public speaking, the more afraid you're going to be of death because they're all kind of intertwined with this idea of identification and self. So while, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, I don't, I don't even know if I'm like afraid of death or not. If someone came in to my room right now with a knife, like, yeah, I'd be afraid because there is a physical danger. But when we think about death, we think about the idea of us. And so the less you identify with that idea, the less fear there is of anything, including death is my, so that's my like initial take, but yeah, interested in Ray's thoughts too. <laughs> that was epic. I just want to say that that was, that was awesome. Um, it's interesting, right? Because when you look at the idea of death and, and you tip, look at the typical conversation about it, you get people like Dolores Cannon and they'll tell you that, you know, life has a particular purpose and that you have to get it right. Otherwise you got to repeat all of this. And so there's this whole narrative about, you know, whether or not you're, you're going through the purity tests and whether or not you're going to repeat this thing and how earth is, you know, the hardest level of all of the incarnations and all this stuff. And there's all this narrative about all that. But when you get rid of all of that and you really start picking it apart, you start to realize that, okay, I don't know any of that. that that's not, that's not what I know. What I know is my existence. And, and so that's the first place to start with this conversation, right? Even you said um, there's nothing that's going to die. And so that kind of implicate or implies that we're looking at things in a way that doesn't serve us or, or at least in a way that's inaccurate. Like we identify with our form. And I find that to be really interesting because, okay, so I think this is part of where the conversation comes from as well as like, take my life, for example. I, I grew up or I was born into a shitty situation with shitty parents in a shitty fucking place. And I had to go through all these lessons of, of hating myself and losing myself and being hurt and hurting others and doing all that to finally find myself where I am now. And in this journey, I'm really enjoying this journey now. Like I, I love being Ray. It's a lot of fun. It really is. And is there any attachment to Ray? Well, for sure, because I had to go through all that shit to get to this wonderful spot. Right. And so am I afraid of that disappearing? No, I'm not. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And it's because I'm still the me I was when I started. I'm still the me I was underneath all of those lessons that I was learning. It's still the same awareness. The form I'm in, the, the part of my journey is not who I am, right? I've been me the entire time. And once you stop identifying with your form, once you stop identifying with human thought, human concepts, and you start just looking at the fact that you are aware, forget what you're aware of, because immediately you'll start thinking about ideas and concepts and, and all this stuff, this narrative, this fiction, but just be where you are, be what you are. And you will find that you are just awareness. You are the state of awareness. And if you look at any living thing, that's exactly what it is. And the more that you recognize that you're just the state of awareness, this form is just a house. It's just what, what this state of awareness gets to experience in terms of how big the options are or how, how wide the, the, the uh, potential is. That's it. And so the more you do that, the more you can start to empathize with animals, the more you can start to empathize with mold or grass or trees or anything. And why? It's not because they bear any resemblance to you but you can see the resemblance and it's not the form. It's what's beneath the form. It's what's being expressed through the form. Because when you ask, you know, what is me, right? That's exactly it. Everyone is me. Everyone looks at themselves as me in every form because that's always what we are. That's what I am. That's what will always be. And that can't die. 
because that is existence itself. It can't die. The only thing that, that we get afraid of is losing the form that we've become attached to, that we identify with. But if you don't identify with the form, if you understand that your awareness, that's it, just awareness, that everything within your body is awareness on smaller and smaller levels and greater and greater complexity if you look at society and whatnot, then you start to recognize that there is no death. And I wanna go on the other end of that in a second in terms of the afterlife, what happens when we actually die. But right now we're just talking about what life is and what life is is ongoing and it's unitary. It's one thing. It can't ever die. The problem is, is that we think that we end with our body because we think that we are our body, but we're not. And that's been the entire point of this podcast, right? It's not, it's not about believing in dualistic unity. It's not about believing in unity at all because that will always be a concept, but it's about understanding that nothing you think, none of your concepts ever come close to the gravity, to the vast impact of the simple insight that your awareness is the root of your existence, that awareness itself is existence. That changes everything and changes all of your perspectives about death. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I just fucking love talking about this stuff. It's so fun. And, and it's like when you ask enough questions and when you just go down the path of, of questioning, which a lot of people, especially in our society that is, is very identity focused and, and driven, it gets uncomfortable when you get to a certain level of questioning. Some people never ask questions, but what you find is that the more you question, especially the question of who are you, the more you realize, the more you kind of strip away all the things that you thought you were, all you have to do is, is ask, like, who am I? And, and something will come up and you'll be like, eh, well, I mean, no, I'm not that, you know, that's not what I am. You know, maybe I'm aware of, of that happening or aware of that thing. And, and you get, you go through enough things like body, thoughts, mind, story, all of these things. And you're like, no, not that. No, not that. No, not that. That's just a thought or that's just an idea, or that's just, you know, a grouping of cells. It's like, you get to the point where you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm none of those things. And it's not that you have to believe that you are something. It's just, it's almost like a, I don't know, like a anti-definition. Like you go through enough things that you're like, not that, not that, not that. It's like, what's left? What's left is right now. What's left is your experience. What's left is right here, right now. There's no concept involved in that. There's no idea. There's no thought. There's no strength, no weakness, no fears or desires. It's just aware of all of those things. And so when you see that you are that awareness, and <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm still like carrying over from the last episode a little bit, like just to specify, like awareness is just a word. So <laughs> for anyone who, who may have come into the last episode and been like, oh, that, you know, that other stuff made a lot of sense. Awareness is just a word. It's just the best word we use. It's the word that we have come to to best describe this feeling of just being existence here and now so you see that you're just the awareness of all of these things all of a sudden there's no identity to cling to and and i think the further you go down that because that is still you're still stopping at a point and and you can still settle on an egotistical idea of being you know the awareness of specific things, but without that identity, there is no spe specificity to that awareness. And so that's what I kind of got caught up when I first realized like, oh shit, I'm not my story. You know, I'm not Andrew. I'm, I'm like aware of Andrew, but like Andrew never existed. So there is no awareness of Andrew either. Cause that's still egotistical. That's still dualistic. That's still separate. So what you see the further, once you take that even further is you see, oh, that awareness is the same across everything. And, and I think seeing that, you know, you don't actually have a name, you were given a name, but if none of us had names, even the animals you see, like you're, if you have a pet, if you have a dog or a cat or a fish or something, you name it. But if you don't have a name and it doesn't have a name, you more clearly see that's the same thing. That's the same awareness right there. And with, so without that identification, you know, birth and death happens all the time. It's all around us at all times, but there's no longer a clinging to one 
idea that you have that dies or that is born. It's just life. It's not, you know, life and death are not opposites. Birth and death, you could say are, you know, across the same spectrum or opposites or whatever, but life has no opposite. Life is, existence is, there couldn't be anything else. What, you know, what would non-existence look like? You know, you wouldn't even know. Yeah. It's uh, there's a great song. I can't remember what it is, but uh, lyric goes, we're just bubbles in a boiling pot. And I thought that was a great line because that that's the um, entirety of our existence, right? We kind of bubble to the surface. We experience what it is to have an inner and an outer, right? And then we're back to the water, right? And that's the thing, but we were the water the whole time. It never changed, just our perspective, right? Just our form changed. And, and so, yeah, it, it's really interesting. And going through the other end of it, um, before we're born or, or after we die, there's that question, well, what is that? And we've talked about this a few times and I try to cover this um, in some of my TikTok videos, but is there an afterlife? No, because there's only life. Like that's the whole thing. That's why even uh, when uh, the apostles were asking Jesus, well, what happens after we die? He's like, you're not getting this. God is of the living. And he actually gets quite upset. I think he calls them fools or something like that. Like they just weren't paying attention to everything he was saying. Um, but it's because existence is life. Life is existence, right? And when our loved ones die, our loved ones aren't dying. The form that they were expressed through is dying. We are the form that they're continuing to be expressed through. We are our loved ones. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? But because we identify with the form, we go, oh, this is my consciousness. This is my awareness. That's your consciousness. That's your awareness. It's like, nope, this is just the collection of shit that I've picked up along the way in this incarnation. That's what's expressing this awareness. It's being expressed through the lens that my life has basically developed into. I am the lens that my awareness shines through. You are another lens, but it's all the same awareness, right? The only thing that changes is how it shines through the filters it's got to go through the, the twists and turns or how the light is blocked. And that's all stuff that we pick up along the way. And it's really interesting because of course the clearer your lens is, it's almost like you, you provide the light for other people to go, shit, my lens is really dirty. And so it just allows them to get that out of the way. But th that's really what it is, is when you die, when, when your body dies, when you experience that last great high before detaching completely, which is really what detaching always feels like. When, as soon as you surrender the illusion, you get a, a feeling of being high. Well, that's what dying is. And then life goes on. See, that's the whole thing is that your incarnation wasn't you. I'm you. Everybody else is you. So if you're ever wondering what, what's going to happen after I die, you're going to go on living as everything, as everyone else. And what's fun is if you want to go a layer even deeper, even trippier, that doesn't mean in time. That means in all variations of the here and now, in all moments, throughout, throughout eternity, because, of course, time doesn't exist. Yeah, man. Oh, that's I feel like that's still one that I don't know if I've, I've fully just the idea of I get, you know, now is is all there is. It's like and I know it's just an, uh, an illusion that just feels is so good. You know, the idea that you go on living as everything, I guess, understanding that uh, it's just, it's kind of the same as, as experiencing through, you know, a specific seeming, seemingly specific location as this body. It's like seemingly specific point in time as here and now, but it, it's, that's not it either. And I think using that tapestry analogy that you used in some of our past episodes helps me understand it a lot more because you just see that you're just, you know, a, a lens on the tapestry with no division and no, you know, progression through time. And I guess this might be a good time to, to bring up not to, and we'll get into keep going with the death stuff, but with, uh, with Einstein, that question brought up last time with, uh, I believe the question was, so like, or I'll just let you say it. 
Um, Thank you. Because I know you asked it. <laughs> Absolutely. So the question that I had asked Andrew um, was in relation to Einstein's brain, which of course, after Einstein died, they took his brain and they kept his brain to analyze it and figure out what made him Einstein. And what they figured out was that, um, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but there is an especially thick layer of connective tissue in, on Einstein's brain that they believe facilitated his intelligence. And my question to Andrew was, was Einstein intelligent because of that thicker connective tissue? Or did that thicker connective tissue develop because of Einstein exercising his intelligence? Yeah. And so that was last week, uh, or maybe it was on a Patreon call or something. But anyway, I, I thought about it, you know, at a few different points throughout the week. And I kept going back and forth, like there is no, you know, cause and effect. So whether the material formed because he allowed, like was intelligent or was he intelligent because he had the connective tissue, like which one was it? Or could it be that there was, it was like, there was no difference in that. And, and even, even him like being intelligent, it was almost like he allowed that intelligence to be expressed. And because there wasn't an illusion kind of diluting or blocking the intelligence that we all are, you know, the intelligence of the universe, the intelligence of existence, because there wasn't so much of his identity of who he thought he was blocking it. Maybe that that idea clouds us so much that it, it kind of takes up brain space and doesn't allow the, the material to develop as much. So without that, it allows for, if you want to sink your teeth into an idea, like all the crazy shit that he came up with, it allows for that space to grow more so. But the main thing is like with no cause and effect, you know, it's kind of like chicken or the egg type thing. And it's like, well, there is no beginning and there is no, and so like, which could it even be one or the other? If they're all, if, if it's all eternally now, then, I mean, I guess when he, so like when Einstein was born, he would probably didn't have as much connective tissue, but maybe he did. Uh, I don't know. So long story short, I didn't come to like a definite answer, but I guess that's what we're always doing. And we're always just discussing the idea. Um, but I'm curious your, your takes on it. Cause I don't know, getting into, you know, cause and effect. And if there isn't any, like it, they all happened simultaneously. I love it. Then that's it. Is that it's one of those circular conversations, which is why I dropped it on you. Um, because it's just, fun to chew on, but it's really, so if you look at Einstein's habits, for example, especially when he was younger, when he came up with the majority of his groundbreaking ideas, right? Um, Einstein would wear the same outfit every day. So he, he would deliberately go out of his way to make sure he didn't have to choose what he was going to wear every morning. And so he saved himself time. He saved himself all of that effort of identification of what people are going to think about me. What do I have to wear? Am I going to be acceptable? He's just like that. And that was it. And so imagine how much time he saved. Right. And then the question goes, OK, so let's just say that Einstein just was born with this predisposition to having this this thicker layer of connective tissue. And so intelligence was an easier option. Let's just say that that might be the case. Would Einstein's habits, if he were to identify more, if he were to be more egotistical, if he was to be more controlling and more you know, sucked into illusions, would that diminish that intelligence regardless of that connective tissue? And if that's the case, how many people are out there right now with the same amount of connective tissue who just aren't utilizing it and will never find out because they're not allowing themselves to tap into that same thing that made Einstein Einstein, right? And so there really is, there's no answer, but it really comes down to, again, like what is our role in this? And how, how deep does our influence go? Are we limited by our biology or are we influencing our biology all the time as we move along? And, and that is, that's a significant question to ask because we know 
that just through focusing on stress, we can make ourselves sick. We know that we affect our physiology. And so it's entirely possible that not only are we affecting you know, our, our immune system in terms of physiology, but we're also affecting our capacity for clarity, that we're also affecting our capacity for an, for an evolved type of human brain that goes beyond homo sapien, right? So it really comes down to, does the clarity that we're experiencing change our physiology to make that clarity easier to experience over and over and over again? And I would say that that is exactly the case because when I was in high school, they said, whatever you learn to do, your brain will get better at. And that blew my mind, continues to blow my mind every day because that means that each and every time I abandon something I'm afraid of because I recognize that's not real. Each and every time I abandon some form of identity because I realize it's not giving me the value I thought it was, it makes it easier for me to continue to abandon that. Which begs the question, well, what's possible? Exactly how many insights are available to us that we're not seeing already, including about life and death. And it really affects everything in terms of our conversation, including mental health. There is this common argument that depression is, a cause, is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. And there's an argument against that saying, right, but the chemicals in our brain are effect, affected by our behavior, by our focus. So is it the chemical imbalances in our brain causing depression or is it our focus on the things that, are, that depression revolve around that's causing the chemical imbalance in our brain? Are we getting better at being depressed by focusing on being depressed? Yeah, I, th that is, it's a, such an interesting argument. And there is, you know, unfortunately, there is so much identity in it that there's people who won't have the conversation and will get, you know, triggered by it in different ways. But it's kind of like, you know, the saying, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And I love, I've always loved that saying, but I think it's definitely exponential. And we've talked about this a lot. And, you know, I talk about this in videos a lot, just coming back to action. Like it's what you do. It's not about what you think or what you think you could do or think you can't do. It's about what you do. And the more you do it, the better you get. And the better you get, the more you do it, the more you do it, the better you get. And it's like this vicious cycle that's like very much exponential. And I've found that to be the case, especially with identity. And since I had that insight last July that like, I'm not Andrew, it's just grown and grown and gotten easier and easier. Whereas at first it was like, just so powerful that I felt high for a week. It's like that it, it, I haven't felt like I'm, you know, high on stuff every single day since then, but it's just almost become sort of, it becomes like your base sentiment to the point that, you know, things happen, people say shit and it just, there's not even a split second reaction at times. It's just an immediate, like, yeah, I know, I know what they're going through and I see what they're going through and they're clearly struggling with some stuff. And there's like, no identification to be for to be like oh my god like i'm so hurt by that it's like who am i you know i'm not andrew all they see is andrew and i forget that sometimes i forget when i talk to people and meet people that they're you know just seeing this story they have about me and it's it's very interesting because you see the more you see the more you the more clearly you can see that like everyone has a story about everyone else off of typically no basis. Even people you're close with is still like such a small understanding a fraction of an understanding of, of what you've actually been through or who you actually are. Not even like getting into the lack of identification. It's like no one actually knows what anyone's been through. And, and so there's so much, just surface level judgment out there. And I see, I just see it so often with other people too. And, and sometimes I'll chime in and sometimes I'll just keep my mouth shut and, and it's, it, but it's fascinating to see it. And as you see that, you see that that's why they're so concerned with what everyone thinks because they're doing it. So everyone assumes that everyone's kind of acting as they do. So on the flip side, you know, I'm not 
judging people as often. So it's like whether or not someone's, so I don't think people are judging me as often, but they might be, but like, even if they are, it doesn't matter. Like it, I don't give two flying fucks about it, but even if they are judging me, it's like, they're not. Cause as Ray has said many times, if they're judging you, they don't see you. Like they don't see that they're just seeing a reflection of, of them in you that they're judging. So it's like, once you more clearly see that stuff, it's just so like, there's nothing left to get that angry and frustrated and, and worried about because you know, you just so clearly see the actions of others and, and where they're sort of rooted in. So it's not even like you get, there's much to get mad about. It's like, there's a feeling of empathy towards it because, you know, you've been through the same sort of stuff, but you know, the, the more clearly you see it, the less there is to, to ever judge. Yeah. And it's not because you shouldn't judge. It's because it doesn't make sense to judge. That's the whole point, right? It's clarity as opposed to morality and some weird structure that, that tells us how to act. That never works. And at least it never works for long because let's just say you do come up with a structure, the 10 commandments. Let's just make it easy to, let's just say, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Those are rules. Okay. I'm following the rules. That guy's not. Now immediately I'm judging him because I am following rules and not understanding he's me. So I'm really not following the rule. I'm following the concept of the rule, right? Somebody asked me this um, today. They're like, well, I don't understand how following the golden rule of treating other people the way I want to be treated is a bad thing. It's like, first of all, that's not the golden rule. <laughs> I just wanted to say it has nothing to do with your preferences. And that's the danger. It's not about treating people the way you think you'd like to be treated. That's still egotistical. That's just your preferences. It's about the genuine recognition that that person's you and then allowing empathy to act. And empathy is not conceptual. Empathy is not something you reach for, for a moral code or for some kind of structure. Empathy is something where you, you see pain, you experience that pain as if it's yours, and then you act accordingly. That's the reality of empathy as opposed to following rules, right? And that's how dangerous this can get. And so I wanted to bring that up again because the, the person who asked this question about death was saying like, how do we really absorb this dualistic unity mentality? It's like, you don't, you don't. There's nothing to absorb. There is no concept whatsoever to take in. Like, I don't want you to go, we're all one and believe that, right? It's why don't I see that we're all one? What am I holding on to that's tearing me apart from everything else? And just question that stuff until there's nothing left. And then you'll realize that all of the reasons that you thought you were alone and separate were your reasons that you created or were taught over time, but they were never real. They were completely within the universe that is you. Yeah, damn. It's, it's so, and that's such a freeing understanding, I think, that you don't have to believe in something or cling to something or remember something like you can so it's so obvious when someone feels like they're remembering how to be and, and remembering what to say and, and what to do and it's like there is nothing to remember there's no right answers there's no correct way to live it's just questioning to oblivion like if there's anything I would recommend doing is just to question who you think you are, your thoughts about the world, thoughts about other people, judgments of yourself, judgments of judgments of others, just question them. It's not, it's not a belief. It's not, an, it's not even so much a, a outright action. It's just a questioning of the actions. It's like, why did I do this? And it's like, well, I did it because of this. Well, why do I believe this to be true? And it's just, it's just every time things come up and the beauty of it and, you know, something I haven't, I haven't really been reading a ton of books recently or anything. It's like, there's so many things when you're just aware of existence, so many things that come up, there's so many insights to be had throughout the day. It's so, it's just, it's kind of mind blowing how many there are when you get your whole idea of yourself out of the way. So if you can just question them as things come up and and the beauty is too like you'll have kind of i don't know like uh 
immediate reactions. I don't know, like gut reactions to things where, where you go for something or you do react. Like I've been, you know, I've been with my family for the past three weeks in Florida. Like we've, we've had, we have a couple, you know, we, we get in each other's in arguments here and there. And, but we're also overall pretty much everyone's pretty quick to forgive too. And it's like, and you can almost feel when someone's holding on to something and, and they're not willing to let it go yet. And maybe a couple hours pass. And then there's always like, Hey, I'm sorry. I was, I was such a fucking dick before or something, you know, it, it's, and it comes up and, and as, as you let those things go, it kind of like, I don't know, builds relationships as you go through those things. And, and then the next time something comes up, you're like, fuck, this went down this whole path last time. And like, it took so much energy and I just, I don't really want to go through this again. Like, I'm just going to stop it here. And as you stop, they stop. Cause everyone in arguments, usually everyone's so tied to their identity. Everyone's trying to get the last word in. It's like, you can, if you can see that there's no benefit to gain from quote unquote winning that argument, you can let it go and be totally fine. You can see that there is, there is like a win in letting something go without getting last word in or without being right in the argument. It's like, there's nothing to gain. If they want to solidify their ego more strongly by being correct and, and knowing what they think they know, like let them have it. And you can see that letting it go and being okay with not being right is diminishing that ego that, that, you know, is the root of all of your suffering. There's a lot of benefit to be had. So even in the arguments, even in anything, there's so many insights all the time, whether you label it as positive or negative. So it's, it's just see that and, and question the reasoning. Yeah. Cause it's not even, and this is it. Like last week we talked to uh, Suzanne Chang from Suzanne non-duality on YouTube. And we were talking about the illusion and where we differ from Suzanne's message is that her message is that the illusion itself should be abandoned, that it doesn't exist. And what we're saying is that the illusion is necessary to existence because the illusion is existence. The illusion of separation is the experience of existing. That's it. So it's not that you should question the illusions into nothingness. It's that you should question your attachment to the illusions into nothingness. It's that you should question how much you believe the illusions until you don't. That's it. You can still use them. You can still play in them. You can still participate in all of this fun stuff because at the end of the day, you're no different than certain cells within your body. Like Andrew was talking about his family and how, you know, we get along most of the time, but every once in a while, there'll be a bit of an upset. Well, the same is true with the cells in your body. Cells in your body get along just fine. Every once in a while though, there's a bit of a conflict and they have to change and they have to adapt and you evolve as a result, right? And the same is true for us as individuals, as a collective. Those little arguments, those little conversations are us collectively evolving, just like the cells within our body. It's just that we get so caught up in our preferences and we get so caught up in, in our idea of ourself that those conflicts, which would ordinarily be much less, let's just say there would be less distortion and less energy in that conflict are exacerbated by the distortion that we're committed to, by the illusion that's keeping us from finding that connection and that empathy in the conversation, which is often what happens a few hours later when somebody surrenders their point of view, goes, oh yeah, okay, now I'm seeing clearly, okay, yeah, that's all making sense now. And that's all it is, is all of a sudden you just surrender your point of view long enough to see the points of view that have been there the entire time. Right? And that's it, it's not about surrendering the illusion. It's about understanding that the illusion when overcommitted to will really twist you out of shape. Yeah, absolutely. And when you brought that up with like the cells, I, I was thinking of, you know, the idea of heaven in an afterlife and how people always think of that as just perfectness, all good, no bad, all of these things. And it's like, well, first of all, there's no good and bad, except for what is based on your individual perception usually comes down to your preferences based on how comfortable and comfortable you feel in a certain situation. But with something like an argument, it's like, of course there's going to be discussions and arguments because we are existing in this illusion of duality. Like we, so we all have different perspectives and different experiences. So I was thinking like, 
if there was, so like, say we were, you know, in, in heaven and everyone was in the clouds with sky daddy and everything. And it's like, there was no arguing all good. It's like, there would be no difference in perception and, and no illusion of, of division. So it would just be unity. Like, exactly. It, it would just be where there would need be no separation. There would be no individuality. There would be no bodies. It would just be, you know, unitary, singular awareness. So because we have, we, we are, feel like we're separate and feel like we are this and someone else is that, of course, there's going to be conflicts and discussions and, and disagreements and arguments. And I think the more tied to those identities we get, the more fucking blown out of proportion, those arguments and disagreements are going to, are going to be. And that's what leads to things like wars and insane famine and suffering and, and all of those negative things that we don't want. Well, when you think of it through or, or understand it through this light, it's like we, when it's so clear, it's so clear that it's tied to the illusion of division and that distortion that we feel. So the more distorted we get, the more insane these things are going to be, the ins- more insane and crazy these disagreements are going to be. So it's like, if there's less of it, maybe it's just some, some friendly banter back and forth when there's a ton of it, there's fucking world wars. So it's so tied to that illusion of duality. So if you believe that to be the truth, you're going to have, there's going to be a lot of conflict and, and disagreements because you're clinging to an idea of yourself and clinging to an idea of who other people are. And so you have to prove yourself and you don't realize that you're solidifying that illusion of division through those arguments and through needing to be right to prove that you exist as something separate than something else is really it. That was awesome. It's really interesting how the mythology kind of takes over the insight, right? Because what we're talking about is how there is an eternal moment in the now that you are the center of. And the ripples that you create through your commitment to division as an illusion or your, your understanding of, of unity as what is affects the world around you. It affects reality, right? So we're, if this was the kingdom of heaven, for example, unity, and everybody recognized it, the world would be a very different place than it is right now. But because of each of our individual commitment to the illusion of division, we perpetuate division. And so we've turned the kingdom of heaven gradually into the kingdom of hell. And what I find really interesting is that in the Bible, they talk about non-physical entities, demons and angels, right? Within God, within the universe. Well, what is that if not our more altruistic intentions or our most uh, selfish intentions? Those are our demons and our angels. And so if you think about the battle for heaven that they're always talking about in, in the Bible and in biblical mythology, the battle between heaven and hell is us. We're the battle between heaven and hell. We're the deciding factor in what this eternal moment becomes. That's our responsibility. But it's not after we die, because there is nothing after we die. It's here now. And that's, that's our option. It's not a requirement. We can do whatever we want with this planet, with this reality. But it is our option, because there's no division. So it's on us. And that's the problem with everybody waiting for the second coming of Christ or for God to come down with judgment day and all of that. We're just putting off our own accountability, right? And as a result, we're getting closer and closer to that point where the division is going to end up erupting into what it always erupts in, conflict. It always erupts in conflict until we start to smooth it out and realize that we are the point of conflict that it starts with. It's our division that creates that conflict. Yeah. And, and see, as you mentioned, like seeing that you're just always now, like you're always this moment, you're always the response that you're having now, the decision you're making now, there's so much freedom in that because it's complete freedom from the narrative of who you think you are or what you think you are. And, and in that, because you're not tied to what you think other people think about you or what you think you are. It's like, you're able to actually act through clarity and empathy because there isn't an idea that you're clinging to that you're acting along with. 
it's like, oh, well, in this moment, I could do this. It's almost like thinking and building up this idea of you being like if someone told you you were a selfish person and you believed them, you would act more so through selfishness because you think that's who you are. So it almost like that sort of cause and effect thing. It's, it's, you're acting, you then act selfishly, which makes you think that you are selfish and continue acting selfishly. But if you see that you are not anything outside of right now, no matter what happened five seconds ago or five years ago, it's just right now, you can see that you have infinite options and, and you're not a selfish person. You're not an angry person. You're not a worried person. You're not an overthinker. You're none of those things because those things are all ideas that are rooted in the past. Those ideas of what someone told you that you were, or what you believed that you were because of previous actions that had been taken, but those have nothing to do with what you are right now. And in every single moment, you have the opportunity to sort of shift that paradigm of, of what this idea of what you are. And it's always shifting. There's not like, oh, you, you change it in this moment. And now it's now your change. It's like, no, there's no you. It's just this moment. But you can, because those actions snowball on each other and because they're exponential, you know, the more you do it, the more you shed that narrative and the more actions you take in the moment towards whatever you, you know, want to be. And it's not, you know, even a manifestation thing. It's just a right now, every single moment, you have all of these options. You have any option you could ever imagine. The only thing telling you otherwise is the story that you keep telling yourself. The only thing that's holding you back from seeing that you have infinite potential options to choose from right now is the story that you keep telling yourself, whether someone else told it to you and you believe them, or either way, it's still you kind of telling yourself that story. You have options and you're only ever right now. And there's so much freedom in that realization. And a believer would take that and describe it as the grace of God found you know forgiveness through through heaven and all of that and what you're really talking about is just coming back to reality where you are in the present moment and you have infinite potential to go either way if you're not holding on to a narrative that narrows your possibilities and that's all we're talking about that's all they were talking about about the infinite forgiveness or the grace of god in the kingdom of heaven it's the here and now it's not something you have to wait for death for because you're going to be sorely disappointed because there's no death right like if your body dies your awareness just continues on in other bodies right without the body awareness is not experiencing that's the whole thing like we always get caught up in this idea of the body right we are meat suits running around i had somebody argue with me about this very early on in tiktok she was very upset by the fact that i just wouldn't admit that i'm i'm a meat suit it's all i am it's like okay but that's a perspective like that's a perspective of What we know is an energetic form that we experience as as biological, sure. But our awareness, our awareness of this form, we can't say that that's purely physical. We can't even say that the experience we're having is purely physical when we break it down energetically. I mean, that's the whole point that we, we can't really determine if it's a dream or not. Right. So it goes way deeper than this, this meat suit. And it really comes down to the paradox. It comes down to understanding that the reality you're aware of, you're aware of is your awareness that is it and if you can follow that rabbit hole as far as possible you will end up at the end of time or the beginning of time however you'd like to look at it and you will end up realizing that you're all that ever has been and all that ever will be and it just comes back down to, to recognizing it not believing it and that's the problem is that people recognize this they go into that state they go oh wow Oh, there's no time. Everything's one. And my sins are, are a fiction. Like my sins have been forgiven and they come out of it and they're like, I feel so much better. I just connected to reality. Well, what's the, what do you mean? Well, it's this whole thing that we're all one. And immediately people in a divisive mindset take that and they run with it and it create, creates a mythology. It creates a concept of what it is to get there. And then everybody's just trying to achieve that concept, which takes their, takes them further and further from the truth that it's pointing to. Right. And that's the whole thing. This conversation we're having is the same conversation they were having before any holy books were written ever. Right. This is the conversation it's based on. 
The only question is how deep does this conversation go? And we get so caught in the, the superficial parts of this conversation that we don't recognize the depth of the paradox that it's based on. Because at the end of the day, everything is you. And you can take that in and just keep taking it in. It just keeps getting deeper. And I say this after 20 years of enthusiastically exploring that hole, it just keeps going and it just keeps getting more and more uh, beyond belief. That is the best way I can put it because it's awe-inspiring to recognize existence for what it is. And that's the point of this. Question everything until it's just you as existence. Yeah. I love it. And, and so something people ask, and I know they ask you also is like, how do you know you're right? And the thing is, I don't. And, and sometimes the first thing I say is, well, there is no me. So for me to be right, there would require division and identification. And <laughs> so that, that gets them going immediately. And they're like, what, what the fuck are you talking about? But no, it's not that we think anything it's that there is there is so much questioning that happens that there's very little that is left if anything and so it's like having a discussion with someone about a topic and they haven't done any research and you've done like a ton of digging into it and have come to just a different conclusion they're like well how do you know you're right and it's like i don't but like you know, I've, I've questioned everything that I thought this was so many times for so long that I've, I've marked off a lot of things that I'm not is basically it. It's not that I'm believing that I am a thing or not a thing or blah, blah, blah. It's just like seeing through the distortion a little bit and seeing that, you know, this identity that you've built up is rooted in past and, and you weren't, you know, when you were born, you didn't inherently have a name. You are not like Ray isn't Ray. Andrew isn't Andrew. These are just names that were given to this grouping of cells that is made out of the same shit as its environment. So it's like, oh, well, if this is made out of the same shit as its environment, like where, why is, why are you identifying as this? Well, cause it feels like it's me. And I was told it's like, yeah, cause you were told that you were this and, and throughout your conditioning, when you were basically a sponge between before the age of 10, you were just a sponge of information. Everyone was telling you that you were this, and they told you that you had strengths and weaknesses. So of course you believe them because at that age, you don't have the wherewithal to question those people that you trust and those people in authority to telling you who and what you are. So it's not that we believe that we're right. It's not that anyone who understands this believes that they are correct. It's it's seeing through the distortion of what people think is correct. And it's like you get in a discussion with someone. It's not that, or for example, if I get in a discussion with someone who believes certain things, it's not that I'm saying that I have the right answer. They're saying they have the right answer. And I'm asking them to question that answer. That's it. It's not that I'm like, no, I'm right you're wrong. They're like, no, I'm right. You're wrong. It's like, I'm not saying I'm right. You're saying you're right. And I'm just saying you're not. I'm just saying to question what you think is right. And, and to not settle on an answer because people who, you know, don't question, they settle on answers because it makes them feel comfortable, but just because you're comfortable doesn't mean you're correct. So it's not even a right or a wrong thing. It's just a questioning of what you think is correct. And it's the refusal to settle on a bullshit self-soothing answer because it makes you feel better because you're scared. That's it. It's not, it's not a belief. It's not a correct thing. It's just a questioning until there's nothing left basically. And that's about it. Until it's just a big unfolding insight all the time. Like that's, that's it. You know, and I've had the same conversation. It's like, well, you know, that's your belief. It's like, no, no, no. It's what remains. It's what remains. That, that's, that's it. Like everything I'm saying is what remains after questioning everything. And, and you can tell by questioning me because then I'll gladly talk to you about it. I'm not going to get upset. I'm not going to get defensive. I'm not going to, you know, get offended by the fact that you have a different idea because I'm not holding on to an idea. 
And that that in itself is the litmus test. And I wanted to mention one more time before we get too far into this episode quickly. We have a group chat coming up this Wednesday for Patreon supporters. Join us there. We also have another group chat coming up the first Wednesday of April, which is free for the public. So you can register for that on our website. I want to mention this quickly because we always end up, end up waiting to the, la- the end of the two hours to do so. So I'm just making a quick segue and then we're going to get back into this concept of, uh, of what is. Well, not even the concept of what is, but we're going to get back into the reality of what is versus the concept of what is, because I think that it really is the crux of why we're afraid of death. At the end of the day, it's the end of the concept. The idea that I don't continue, but I was never what I thought I was. And this is something I wanted to mention because this is kind of where the message that Suzanne is is talking about applies to the conversation of death, but not necessarily to the conversation of existence, which is really kind of interesting, right? Because there is no us. There is no we, there is no I, there is none of that. The experience of of separation is an experience alone. It's perceptual at best. Everything just is what it is. Everything is is unity. And that's not something you can get your mind around because if you can include everything within nothing, you might get close to the point, right? But it, it really just comes back down to because none of us are what we think we are, we are what remains. But what we think we are defines our experience. It changes our experience. And so the more we question what we think we are, the closer we get to what remains. But we can't get there by abandoning the experience of us. We can't say, I have no ego. Because the entire experience of I is egotistical, right? And this is where Suzanne and I had had that brief moment of of, um, disagreement in that she's saying that, This message is not for the I. This message is not for the me. There is no message. There's no message because there's nowhere to go. Consciousness is not directing us in a direction. Consciousness is. Consciousness is everything, right? Our experience is a different story entirely. So if you're going to talk to consciousness, you may as well just talk to yourself. Because that's the only way there's not going to be a message or or a messenger is if you're just having self-dialogue which isn't a dialogue, which is why I always say that self-knowledge is not conceptual, right? Being self-aware isn't a matter of having a concept about yourself. I had a friend um, who was a pastor, a Christian pastor, and and of course, we got along just fine, but there was always this, this dividing line between recognizing that we're all one versus believing that we're all part of God. And it was sad to me because We'd agree on so many things, but we'd agree superficially. And what I mean is that he would refer to morality. I would discuss empathy. And while they sounded the same, they're not. They just appear the same on the surface. Somebody being a good person versus somebody experiencing and expressing empathy seem very similar, but have a different impact entirely. Yeah, I find that distinction very interesting and it just comes back to you know belief and in the form of thought versus experience in the form of just awareness of what is and it's like morality exists within thought it only exists within the mind it's it's only a concept it's only something you can think about whereas empathy is an action is what is done beyond the distortion of of thought and and things like that and yeah, mentioning the the dialogue part, I find that interesting because that's not something I've thought about too much. But it's like if there is, you know, the idea this message isn't for the me, this message isn't for the I. It's like, well, there aren't words that are that are there. And and you mentioned like, you know, then just it's for the for the self. Might as well be self dialogue, which doesn't have words. And it's kind of you know same same type of thing. It's like without me or I, there is no language. It's not, it's not a conversation. And it's, as we mentioned, it's like, it's a requirement for the experience of the illusion of duality. The ego is a, is a requirement for it. And it's, it's not the death of it. It's not the killing of it. It's the recognition that it isn't you is the key. That's it. It's, it's, it's not this crazy jarring 
you know, horrendous message. It's just a recognition that it's not what you are. And if you aren't that illusory identification, then what's left? What's left is nothing and everything right now. What's left is this moment, this experience here and now, what you are doing, what are you, what you're aware of, what you're experiencing, and that's it. And if you get caught up in thinking that this message isn't for the I or isn't for the me, it's just a concept. It's something you have to think about to understand. And and what I've come to with any sort of beliefs, it's like, if it requires thought to understand or to recognize, then it's not the truth. And that's been my barometer. And it's, it's pretty, pretty foolproof for the most part. It's like any sort of fictitious belief system comes back to that recognition. If you, if thought is a requirement, thought is not a requirement to exist. Thought is not a requirement to live. It is, it is a functionality. It is a tool that we have developed as, as humans. That's awesome. Like it's really great. The imagination, you know, being able to think about things and and concepts, it's helped with our development a ton and, and evolution certainly, but it's not a requirement to exist. And, and when you are in that sort of state of flow, lack of identity, there isn't thought. If, if there's something you love doing, for example, just think of something you absolutely love, whether it's a sport or you know, hanging out with friends or walking your dog. A lot of times, if not always, there's a lot of time spent in that state without thought. It's, it's like you become one with that action or flow state as people say. So you see in those actions and you can see it through things you love doing. And it's going to be different for everyone based on everyone has different experiences and and preferences and whatnot. But you'll recognize in those experiences that there isn't very much thought a lot of times. And that, you know, whether it's you love that activity because there isn't as much thought or there isn't as much thought because you love that activity, who's to say, is there a separation there? But the reality is that you don't need thought to exist, to experience, to experience empathy or peace or anything. So you don't need thought to understand the truth either. The truth is beyond thought. And that, so, you know, without thought, there's no belief systems whatsoever about who you are, who someone else is, what the creator of the universe, all of it is, it's, it's beyond thought, all of that stuff, beyond thought. Sounds like a, uh, it sounds a lot like the Garden of Eden, nothing to fear in the garden right it just is and, and it's interesting because you can actually think about all of your experiences that way it doesn't matter which experience it is it could be running across the field or just having a shitty day at work if you were to just stop and think to yourself okay if all of reality were to disappear and i was just the consciousness of god and this was one of the potential realities that i could experience how would i make the most of this and all of a sudden your entire experience has changed and it's because you remove the narrative you went right back to the basis of the existence, which is that, right, I'm the crux of this experience. What can I do with it? And that changes everything. And I wanted to mention quickly, because we kind of delved into this a little bit, and I think it's, it really is um, pivotal or, or very important to understanding that there is no death. Unity, or what is, isn't, spa- it isn't within space and time. So everything within space and time is within the potential of unity. Fair, but unity itself is existence. Unity is the one thing that will always be. It's existence itself. Without existence, well, there is no without existence. It's existence. Um, duality is in that. And I say in that, but that's not quite true either. Duality is an experience of that. So all duality is unity. Unity is duality. There's no separation except our perspective. That's the whole thing. So if you want to kill your ego, die. And here's the bitch about that. If your ego dies, your entire life still exists in potential. So all of those moments of ego never die. That's the whole point. They always exist. Every experience of division exists. So even though your experience of division may end, the experience itself, which is you, always will exist. And I know that one's not easy to get your head around, but it's true. The moment of your birth and the moment of your death exist in the here and now. 
The only difference is your perspective of where and when you are. Yeah, damn. I love, I love the duality is unity. And that recognition is so powerful because when you go and start having these conversations and kind of dive into this path, you, you start thinking of, of duality as this, you know, illusion that's, that's separate from unity. It's like, well, there is, you know, source energy or whatever. And then we are pieces of source experiencing humans in this illusion of duality. So there's like this inherent separation there, which doesn't exist. It's not that we are pieces of this separate source energy that's like somewhere else in the universe that has created this universe and blah, blah, blah. It's like, we are it. We are it. There is no separation. Like duality is unity. And, and seeing that it, it kind of short circuits any belief system that you have. It's like, it's very, very difficult to continue to believe in something like a higher power or, you know, a source consciousness that isn't you, that isn't like fully you. I feel like in those, those concepts, there's still like this, this separative misunderstanding. And so seeing that duality is unity, like there isn't an illusion of duality that is within unity and like separate kind of like unity is like this bubble or like snow globe and then duality exists within it. It's like, it's the same. There's no separation between those two things. It is it. That illusion of duality is unity. Like it's the same thing. It is all unity. It just kind of feels like it isn't, but it still is whether it was, you know, this, this source, which is like, kind of looks like a big blue sun or here and now this experience, this conversation that you're listening to, this is unity. Everything is unity. You are unity. You are it here and now without the distortion of identity and thought and belief. Because any idea of unity that doesn't immediately include everything isn't unity. That's the point, right? So if, if you're like, well, there's duality and then there's, there's unity, it's like there's no division. Like that's the whole point. You can take every experience that might ever potentially exist in any universe, on any planet, anywhere, in any form, doesn't even matter. That's all part of unity. And if you, and you can't get your head around that, that's the whole point. That's why I always get a kick out of like our, our photos of the known universe. It's like, wow, that's huge. It's like, yeah, that's all we can measure. That's it. It's not that it ends there, right? It's just that all, that's all that we can measure. And all of that is unity. That's exactly how much potential lies within nothingness, right? Within that point that has no space and has no time and has no identity. There is no other. There's no way to describe this. Like we try to describe it as the void, right? But that's not true either because that kind of gives you this impression that there's nothing there, but everything's there, right? And so it's such an interesting discussion, but when you see it, when you actually start to take it in and you go, Oh, oh, everything I'm looking at is actually kind of superficial. Like I, it goes way deeper than this. It's kind of like the conversation you and I had in uh, early in season one about free will versus predeterminism. And at the end of that conversation, we both kind of just went, so it's complicated. And, and that's, that is the point of this is that if you're coming to an answer or a belief that's just like, yeah, it's this, bam. And it doesn't require you to keep looking at it to get more and more of an appreciation of how full and deep it is. You're missing it. You're missing it. Because again, 20 years that I have been aware of looking at this and every day it becomes more awe-inspiring. It's not ever something that becomes rote or routine. It's not, I dislike referring to words that I've used before. Sometimes I do because they're useful, but basically every day I have new insights about myself, about my experience. And they come out in different ways. I choose different words. I choose different expressions. I see different opportunities every time I surrender what I think I am. And that's where belief falls short. That's where and, and all of this belief about the afterlife, all this uh, idea about God and heaven and everything else, it just falls short compared to the awe-inspiring experience that is awareness itself. Yeah, it's, it's incredible just... <laughs> 
how when it hits you, it's like it's it hits you all the time. And yet sometimes you forget and then it hits you and it's like, oh, holy shit, I was taking all that shit seriously. Like I thought all this and like because for me, it's so such a new and, and you know, relatively new understanding. It's like I forget all the time and then it hits me and I'm like, oh, there it is. Wow. Yeah. Getting caught up in X, Y, Z again. But it's it's like a constant thing and it's a constant. It's not something that you believe, or you have to remember it's, it's like a, it's just a questioning of, of what you get caught up in when you get caught up in it. But that too is unity. Like those ideas within those, those paths you go down of distortion of getting caught up and believing that duality isn't an illusion is still unity, which is the fascinating part. And so something I was thinking about when you were mentioning the universe and, and how, you know, all we know is, is the known universe and what we can measure. It's like, I started trying to comprehend eternity of the universe. And it's almost like my mind gets to a certain edge and it, it can't. And I'm curious, because I know you've been going through this for a long time. Like, is there limitations for our mind to comprehend something like eternity or no beginning and no end like can our mind that is dualistic actually comprehend that or is there like short-circuited limits to us being able to conceptualize those because they're like unconceptualizable if that's a word (laughs) wow what a fantastic question i just want to say that that that's really good um yes but not the way one might think. And, and it's because when we talk about grasping eternity, we immediately start going, well, how far back is the beginning? How far back is the end? But that's not eternity. Eternity doesn't have a beginning and an end. That's the whole point. So in order to grasp eternity, you have to grasp the moment. You have to be present because that is eternity. The moment is eternity. The moment never ends, right? There's just different variations of it. So to grasp eternity, you have to grasp now. Exactly how deep the now is, because the now is everything, and it exists forever. If that helps. Yeah, as soon as you started saying, you know, well, how far back is the beginning? How far forward is the end? I was like, Oh shit, no beginning, no end. Can't go f- super far back, can't go forward. It's right now. Right now is eternity. And it's like that. So I think that is that makes more sense now because I've I've understood, you know, now is is all there is. It's all we experience, it's all we are. You know, we are all as as the present. But I think, you know, it's not until you question those limitations of the beginning and the end of the, of the barriers of the universe, of the walls that we can conceptualize the universe. And then you see, oh, there is no beginning. So that, you know, keeps going or whatever. There's no end that keeps going. There's no, there's no limits to space. So that keeps going. So it's, it's on the time front, it's now. And on the space front, it's here. And that's it. So it's, it's like, once you try and go, to the extent with which you think you can, then it's like, it just immediately brings you right back to that's it here and now, because there is no limitations to where, and there is no limitations to win, then it's just here and now. Okay. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. That's the moment. This is why I say like all of this religious mythology, all of these words, and they're all pointing to the same damn thing. You, they're all pointing to your existence. That's it. They're not pointing to God. They're not pointing to anything other than you because it's all you. It's you entirely without you here. There's nothing. There's nothing. And you can say, well, I don't know that. That's right. You don't take that in. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. That's, that's crazy too. And and just like the idea that if you ask someone like, Oh, is this a dream? 
know, you, it's a it's another circular argument that you can't know. And, and something else I've come to is like a lot of people question, you know, are we in a simulation? It's kind of the same thing. Like, are we in a simulation? Are we in a dream? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, does it matter? Like, would it actually change right here and right now? Because that is the extent of my experience for eternity. So whether it was a simulation or, or whether it was anything, any story, any narrative you can possibly come up with, does it actually change the experience that you're having here and now? And, and that scene in uh, Free Guy that I love so much with when his friend is like, he's, he's asking, is this, you know, what's even real? Are we even real? We're not even real. And he's like, Hey, listen, man, I don't know what's real or what isn't, but what I do know is this moment right now between friends having a conversation is as real as anything I've ever experienced. And it's like, that's so such a powerful statement because it's like that, that's it. That's all there ever is. And, and we like to think that, you know, there, there's more and we get caught up in ideas and, and worries and fears and, and regrets and all these things that are outside of the moment and the whole time where it's like, we're missing the only thing we can ever experience when we get caught up in that and, and realizing that we're sort of in that moment, we're always, you know, manifesting our existence. So we're manifesting an existence of not experiencing what is. And, and so it's, it's, it's uh, snowballs on itself and it's cumulative in that way. And and so seeing it is one thing and then being able to experience it and, and sort of be it in every moment just perpetuates that understanding and, and reality. Oh, it makes life worth living because you're actually in it, right? And it's it's kind of indicative of how far removed we are from life in that we actually have courses on how to be more present and we have you know uh self-help guides on, on you know how to appreciate the moment you're in and all this other stuff it's like we started there that that's where we started like that we all did that when we were born and as children and it's everything we learned on top of that that made it more difficult like and that's it but and it kind of just goes to show you it's interesting that you brought up the simulation theory because that theory is hilarious to me because the only way that that theory holds up is with a complete lack of self-awareness because, well, a sufficiently um, technologically advanced civilization could create a computer powerful enough to simulate all of this. It's like, yes, and they would also identify as I. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like once you see through that distortion, it's... Yeah, it breaks through those walls pretty quick. And then I like that you brought up just uh, the, the idea of, of experience and, and as children, it's like what we forget. And actually this weekend, uh, my family went to a pool nearby and it was like super nice day on a Saturday and went to a pool and, and uh, my brother and I were just like playing in the pool. Basically, there was like a bunch of families around and and i was just like you know big 26 year old kid and we were playing catch with a uh pool football thing and i was like standing on the edge and like he was throwing it over into the pool and i was like diving in seeing how far i could jump and catch it and it was just it was so interesting because that is like the reality of our existence as children is doing those things and there's no reason i couldn't do that all the time. Like I, I, yeah, I have a full-time job. Yeah. I do all my content stuff. Yeah. I do X, Y, Z, but it's like, you can still do stuff like that all the time. And, and we just like, don't, and there's so many people and like all the, there were so many, there was a ton of families there with, it was mostly, you know, younger kids and teenagers and, and their families all there going to the pool, but you know, there weren't adults like playing in the pool and then there was just like me this big kid basically and my brother who's 21 like throwing a football back and forth having a great time and it just it it's almost like we seemed to not that I even noticed but just like looking back on it because of the surroundings and everything we probably stuck out so much because it's such a rarity as an adult to like play and it's crazy. And it's something like Alan Watts talks about it a lot. Like the reality of just 
playing that that is sort of what reality not that it was meant to be that but like sort of and there's so many things as children that are just the reality of being a child are forgotten because you know you got to be an adult you got to grow up you got to do this and you have these responsibilities and you got to do xyz and it's like all that shit's made up all that stuff it's completely made up it's as people think that you have to do these things it's like if you're someone who can just like you know, make money doing something and then do something else all the time at other times, you know, it's like, you don't have to do all that. There's so many things that are like adult things that have nothing to do with work or responsibilities or making money. It's like, you know, you do these things after work because you're an adult and like you spend your weekends doing X, Y, Z. And, and it's like a lot of those things are things that people enjoy, certainly, but there's a lot of things that people just like, don't think of because it's almost like, because they aren't, you know, quote unquote productive, or they're not building up their identity in a way is pretty much what it comes down to in a lot of ways. So they, they focus on something that, that is productive and it's like, there's no time for play, but if, if you're doing all these things in order to do things you enjoy, it's like, we're doing all this work to play sort of, but we forget about the play part. Then we just work our whole fucking lives. Yeah. And what's worse is I remember very clearly as a kid thinking to myself, boy, I'm really looking forward to being bigger so I can play that sport, or I'm really looking forward to growing up. So I'm strong enough to do that. And then when I got old enough to do that, I was too goddamn busy going to work to, to enjoy, to enjoy any of that. And what's funny is that now I'm, I'm 42, you know, I, I feel my aches and pains a bit more. I can recognize where my past injuries were and the, the, the past things I did in the past. And Nonetheless, it's just like, I'm so enthusiastic. I love it. I'm just like, sweet. You know, I'm going to go and, and stretch or I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go whistle at that bird for 10 minutes just because and watch all my neighbors think I'm weird, right? But that's the point is that you kind of forget why you grew up. You forget all of that because the people who grew up ahead of us also forgot. They got caught up in this game as well because there is a balance, right? Like you can say, well, life is play and that is true until you're hungry then life is not so much play life is where do i get food and there's work that goes into that or where do i get shelter and there's work that goes into that and so there is a balance but we have lost that balance in in pursuit of this idea of progress right and and it's progress for for really no valid point i mean and my only evidence for that is the fact that there are thousands of people today right now being paid to make those little plastic um, foot coverings that let you put your sock over it so you can slide your foot into the plastic and then get the sock off without using your hand. Like there are thousands of people making that shit right now. That is not being productive. Like that's not actually doing much in general. And all of those people, if they're not creating food and not creating housing and not creating electricity or, or anything else should be allowed to just go about their day. Right. Like that's the whole point. Like, why? Why are they doing this job? Well, it drives the economy. Yeah. Into the ground. It also drives a whole bunch of garbage into the ground. Right. Like it's not doing anything, but it's, oh, well, we got to keep them productive. Look at all these other people working. It's like, well, why don't we reprioritize what needs to be done rather than just doing as much as we can to keep ourselves busy? Yeah. And I feel like that's sort of mentality, like band-aid mentality that things are the way they are. And, and no one really recognizes that and the way that things are. And I've been I've actually been talking to my, my dad a little bit this week, just about like, what is it? Interest rates and the idea of inflation and all those things. And, you know, he, he has his takes on it and he, you know, knows a lot about that stuff. Um, I think, Part of him doesn't question it, whether it's not the way things have to be, because it's just the way things have always been. And so I'm I'm kind of coming at it and I'm like, well, you know, because the thoughts are, you know, when when the economy is doing poorly, it's like I forget which one I'll probably butcher, but like when it's doing poorly, you raise interest rates or it's doing well, you lower interest rates or, or whatever it is to like you know, stimulate economy, you know, reduce it, like drive 
people to buy more houses or save more money. It's like, there's levers that you pull. It's like, yeah, but, but you're always just pulling those levers and it's over time making it worse and worse. So it it seems like they're just band-aids. Right. And like, you know, there, there isn't always a great answer for that. And I'm like, it seems like just a super fucking broken system. They like, it keeps having leaks and they just keep patching it up, patching it up. Oh, that's leaking again. Patch it up, raise interest rates. Oh, that's leaking again. Patch it up, lower interest rates. Oh, we need, you know, we need more money, print money. Fuck it. We don't care. Like, yeah. Oh, it's devaluing the currency, raise interest rates or lower interest rates. (laughs) It's like all this shit. It's like, holy shit, we just do this over and over and we've done it for, you know, it's not like we've done it forever. Also, it's been like 30 years doing some of these things, 40 years doing some of these things, like a hundred years doing some of these things. This hasn't been a forever thing. And it's like, it's not going to be forever because it's not going to be able to last forever. And whether it's this type of thing that I was just talking about or any sort of mentality, it's going to self-destruct at some point. And it's like, no one wants to admit that. And no one wants to no one's willing to understand it comes back to identity and it comes back to, to death in a way. It's like, because we think that we die, which we are afraid of, we also aren't willing to look at issues from an alternate perspective. And we just patch shit up and use band-aids because it's like, well, you know, I have X term, you know, if you're a politician, I have, you know, two, four, eight year term. Some have lifetime terms. Even if you have a lifetime term that there's a cap to that too. So if you don't recognize that you aren't what you think you are, that you aren't this identity, that you aren't something that can die, all of a sudden your perspective on all these problems shift and you finally look at it from a clearer point of view instead of just, oh, this is how it's been. This is how it's going to keep going until we can't do this anymore and it implodes on itself and you know well i guess our great grandkids are gonna have to pick up the pieces or whatever and it's or us with the rate that things are going is quite frankly like within andrew and ray's lifetime and and everyone listening's lifetime but it's fascinating to see just how many band-aids they throw out there like grown-ass adults who just refuse to recognize it yeah, absolutely. It's funny because you just kind of mentioned a cycle that happens on individual and collective levels, right? Like we invest in something and then it goes, it falls apart. And instead of learning, we double down, we do it again, right? Like whether it's uh, investing in our idea of ourself for security or it's investing in this idea of fiat currency, because you're right, the currency has changed numerous times and each and every generation who's dealt with a different type of currency has went, oh, this is just the way it's going to be forever. And then it doesn't, right? Like back in the early 1900s, they would have said, you know, oh, gold's always going to be the backing of the dollar. That didn't last very long. All of a sudden here comes the 70s. Oh, it's a democratic system now. We just kind of make it up as we go. Um, And what's funny is that they're going to push that to the limit, which they are already doing. And they're still not going to learn when it collapses. What they've already planned to do, and they've been talking about this for like 15, 20 years, is to just get rid of the U.S., Canadian, and Mexican dollar and just introduce one unitary dollar called the Amero. Right. So they're going to start the whole goddamn thing over again so they can reset the money supply and start inflating the fuck out of it again. So it's just repeating the same cycle with a slightly different iteration with exactly the same end result inevitably down the road and and that's the thing is that we don't we don't learn because we're not aware and we're not aware because those who benefit from this really don't want us to be aware and so they're putting all these distractions there to keep us playing the game that benefits them and that's i can't blame them i'm not going to say that that that's not what i would do in that situation what i'm saying is that it is so much more important as a result of that for each and every one of us to be aware individually for our own reasons Right? We can't depend on society to educate us so we can realize what's happening. We can't depend on people on authority coming down and explaining to us that they're not really authorities. They're really just serving a role because they depend on that role. Right? And as a result of that, we can't depend on our reality helping us find awareness. It has to come from us. Which comes back to another question that I was asking you the other day. I want to explore this quickly uh, before we wrap up the episode. Basically, we know that you can take one of two paths towards awareness as a whole. The one path, the traditional path, is to find yourself a guru, a teacher, a teaching, a structure, and to, to follow that structure until insight 
strikes. The other path is to not do any of that, to think to yourself, well, maybe all of these structures are distorted by now. Maybe all of these teachers and these gurus are in fact lost in an illusion that they don't recognize. Maybe it's just on me. Maybe if I'm going to find awareness, I have to do it for myself. And I'm curious because I know my, my perspectives on this, but out of those two paths, which do you think uh, is, is most likely to, to work better? Or do you think both paths can be equally efficient and, and get you to the same place? Do you think you can follow a teacher to awareness? Or it has, does it have to be self-led? Or can it be starting with the teacher and then become self-led? I'm just very curious about your perspectives. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's possible in either way, but eventually it comes back to you. You know, the teacher can't, you know, it's like we've said so many times, reality isn't words, awareness isn't words, reality isn't a teaching, this isn't a concept, this isn't a, a lesson, it's none of those things. So it can't directly come from anyone else. And if you, you know, say, for example, you have a teacher, and you think of them as a teacher or a guru, it's like, boom, right there, you're missing the entire thing, the whole thing, you just miss it. Or if you think of yourself as a teacher, or a guru explaining to someone the idea of unity or awareness or consciousness. It's like, you're fucking missing it too, bro. Like you're missing the whole thing too because you see separation. So with that, any sort of idea or, or relationship in that way, if you believe one or the other to be the truth or you believe yourself to be a teacher or you believe yourself to be a student, you're missing the whole goddamn thing you're missing the whole insight in that belief. So in summary, like, no, you, you can't have a teacher and get to the insight. It can be, yes, it can be sort of like a progress along the way, especially if you're deeply rooted in identity, it can help peel you back to a degree, because some people are, are so deeply rooted in it, they need someone like an outside perspective to just be like, hey, you know, you're not what you think you are. But there comes a point where in order to fully recognize it, which I don't know, seems like maybe not a ton of people do, but at the same time, there are no other people. So it's like, through my recognition or your recognition of it, everyone is recognizing it because there are no others. We are this sort of tapestry that is. So it has to come from you at some point, whether there's someone who does a little bit of work with you to get you there, but there can't be a reliance on it. And there can't be, it can't come directly from it to your understanding. It it's, comes from you. So you just pointed out a serious problem with pretty much every religion. Right. Because we immediately go into it with an idea of the person that that religion is formed around. Right. And it makes it makes it very difficult for us to see ourselves within that person. And that's very much the, the difference in, in studying this and, and trying to memorize it or understand it versus actually recognizing it and, and, and embodying it is that once you do, you start recognizing it doesn't matter who you read or who you listen to. You're listening to yourself. That's you talking through another mouth, that's you experiencing, you know, your awareness through another filter. And, and so all of a sudden it's like, well, well, I could read a book or I could just pay attention because I'm the person who wrote that book. So I may as well just go straight to the source as it were. And, and so everything changes. And, and I think that, that that is the point is that you do have to actually get to that point where you're like, right, this is all about me. And, and abandon those teachings, abandon those teachers, not, not, you know, say that they were wrong, don't don't uh, lack appreciation for everything that they helped you find, but recognize that it was to get you to the point where you, you did what we were talking about that, that Zen student uh, did in the middle of class. You just get up, snap your fan and walk away, right? This is no longer my place. And that's very much the, the stance you have to take in terms of being a spiritual student is that there is no dichotomy between the knower and the one who doesn't know. Those are just self-images. Right? It's just an idea of yourself. Being is the only knowledge there really is. And somebody was saying to this, uh, saying this in one of my TikTok videos lately, that, well, belief 
so belief works for some people. Some people need belief. And, and from there, they have a solid foundation to grow from. But belief is never a solid foundation. Belief is always something that can be threatened. The only thing that's truly solid is the uncertainty of what is. That's the one thing that can never be threatened and is always, always the root of your existence. Yeah, it's like if you if you have a belief and you know someone comes up to you and questions it and you get triggered and angry, it's like, is that really helping you? Is that really helping you get through life and to handle all of these things? Someone just walk up, any random person can walk up to you and be like, you know, that's not the truth, right? <laughs> you know, you're believing in fiction, right? And all of a sudden they're like, oh no, th that's so disrespectful to my beliefs. How dare you question my beliefs? That's, that's disrespectful. I hear that so much. That's disrespectful. It's like, if, if you really can't handle someone asking a simple question or, or pointing out a simple flaw in the belief that you have, and it triggers you and sets you off on this tantrum, how much is it really helping if it's that fragile? And that's the thing is like, all of them are. And, you know, I guess if, if someone is just so has so much cognitive dissonance that they, they just don't freak out when someone questions it. And they're just like, you know, yeah, no, you believe what you believe. I'll believe what I want to believe. It's like, you know, if, if you want to believe in that, I'm, I'm not coming in with a belief in anything, but you know, so I'm, you're kind of wrong on that, but you know, I, 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 I don't know. I have nothing to prove to you. And I've been, you know, last this past fall, I, I definitely got into that and had some fun with it, but I realized that doesn't as, as many seeds as it may drop. And then some people on the brink of things it may help get them to that understanding. There's definitely some sensitivity to it. And there's a, there's a way of going about it that isn't obscenely triggering to everyone you come across. And I guess finding that where you can maybe work through it and recognizing that, you, you know, it's just the whole idea. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. It's like understanding that is super helpful in these discussions and allows you to walk away and be like, you know, whether they get it or they don't, it's okay. I drop some seeds, maybe they'll chew on them and, and get around to it at another time. And if they got upset, perhaps that's exactly what they're supposed to supposed to do. Maybe that's the next stage of their journey. Maybe that's the next insight that they're winding up for. I don't know. You know, I'm just I'm just doing my own thing. I, it's funny. I had an interesting response from somebody today um, where rather than saying I was disrespecting their belief, they said I was disrespecting their deity, which I thought was a super interesting thing to say. It's like, how am I disrespecting a fiction that you've created? That didn't go over well either. But the, the point is, is that, you know, get into the conversation if you want to. And, and if you ruffle some feathers, you do. And if you don't ruffle some feathers, that's cool too. But regardless, you're still playing the part of somebody else's reality and you're still giving them an opportunity should they seek to take it. Doesn't matter what you say or don't say, right? As long as you're there, that, that changes the opportunities that are in front of them. And so that's, that's more or less enough. Um, we are going to wrap up the episode because we're, we're coming up to the two hour mark here, but I did want to make a point quickly because it dawned on me that this might actually help. So as a fetus, we are aware very basically of ourself and an environment that we're within. We have that basic awareness of self. It's not cognitive. It's not thought-based. It's just the feeling of being in something. We'll call that reality. Now, what's interesting about that is that that is true for every kind of fetus. Doesn't matter what the fetus becomes after that point, it's always the same awareness of itself and a reality that it's within. That is what we are in every form. And so it never dies. It is always the foundation of existence. And I really, really wanted to hammer this home because it doesn't matter what form life takes. It will always identify as you, just not the story that you've currently attached to. And that's the nice part about it is that you get infinite chances to make stories or transcend them.
which is really all this is about. So on that note, we're going to wrap up this episode until next week. We do have a guest coming up for episode 11. I'm not going to say who, because who knows what's going to happen between then and now, but hopefully it's going to work out. Um, do join us on Patreon. Join us on Discord. Andrew, do you have anything you want to toss in here before the end? That's about it. Just excited for the week to come of, of live talks and, and next week's guest is someone I'm very excited for. So make sure you tune into that if, uh, if you've been enjoying these. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you next week. Right. Bye, everyone.